Hello everybody. In this video I want to give a quick overview how phosphofructokinase and in particular phosphofructokinase 1 is regulated. We all know that phosphofructokinase 1 is a key enzyme in glycolysis. It catalyzes the reaction from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and uh, by transferring a phosphate residue from ATP onto the 1 position of fructose 6-phosphate. And we get this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which then uh, goes through glycolysis. And because phosphofructokinase 1 is a key enzyme in glycolysis, it needs to be tightly regulated. So how does this actually happen? Now, it all starts with the peptide hormone uh, glucagon, which is secreted by the alpha cells in the Langerhans islet cells of the pancreas. This is a peptide hormone which uh, binds to a cell receptor, uh, which is actually uh, a receptor for a G protein coupled receptor. And uh, in a different uh, video, I explain in more detail how this is done. So, upon signaling from glucagon, which is the, uh, if you like, the hunger. Uh, hormone of the cell, which indicates uh, in the uh, organism that there is not enough glucose in the bloodstream. Um, an intracellular enzyme called adenylate cyclase is activated. Adenylate cyclase uses ATP and produces cyclic AMP. This cyclic AMP then activates what is known as protein kinase A. So without say AMP, protein kinase A is uh, inactive, but in the presence of cyclic AMP, protein kinase becomes active. So what does protein kinase A do? It actually interacts with another phosphofructokinase, and in this case it is phosphofructokinase 2. And phosphofructokinase 2, uh, in the active form, that's this green form here, uh, produces fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. I will come back to that in a minute. So when protein kinase A is activated by the cyclic AMP, it transfers a phosphate uh, residue, or actually several phosphates, from ATP onto PFK2, onto the phosphofructokinase 2. This phosphorylated phosphofructokinase 2, in the phosphorylated form, is not active anymore um, and um, therefore cannot catalyze the reaction that we see here for PFK2. So PFK2, this actually is quite an interesting enzyme because it is a bifunctional enzyme it has, on one hand, it has a kinase domain which uses ATP and transfers the phosphate onto a substrate, but it also, at the same time, does exactly the opposite. It has a phosphatase domain. And the phosphatase domain is active When PFK2 is phosphorylated, the kinase domain is active when P2 
PFKT is not phosphorylated. So by using the phosphorylation of phosphofructokinase 2 through PKA, we can regulate whether it is in the kinase or in the phosphatase state. So if we have it not phosphorylated, PFK2 uses ATP and transfers a phosphate onto fructose 6-phosphate. And that is the same molecule, or well, it is the same compound that also is used by phosphofructokinase 1. But in this case, the phosphate residue is not put onto the one position of the fructose 6-phosphate, it is put onto the two position. So PFK2, when the kinase domain is active, i.e. not phosphorylated, produces fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, this molecule here. And fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a very potent activator of PFK1. So only if we have fructose 2,6-bisphosphate present, our phosphofructokinase 1, the enzyme in glycolysis, becomes activated and can catalyze this reaction, which ultimately leads into glycolysis. If PFK2 is phosphorylated, then the kinase domain is turned off and PFK2 can't do this reaction here. So it cannot produce fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. However, the phosphatase domain is activated upon phosphorylation, so that's this one here, and the phosphatase actually removes the phosphate from the fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate from this one and converts it back into fructose 6 phosphate. And we know what that this is called uh, an ultra, a zero order, let me write this here, this is called zero order ultra sensitivity, ultra sensitivity. Activity because what we have here is two competing reactions. On one hand, it is a phosphorylation. On the other hand, it is a dephosphorylation. Phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, and so on and so forth. And what is the point of that? Well, if we look again, uh, and I've done that in a different video, if we look at the uh, activity ratio of PKA, of the kinase versus the phosphatase, if the kinase activity is stronger than the phosphatase activity, we shift everything in this direction. If the phosphatase activity is stronger than the kinase activity, we shift everything into this direction. And this ultrasensitivity is nothing else but a very clever switch. So we can switch on either the kinase or the phosphatase activity. And in this particular case, we have it in basically the same uh, molecule in terms of phosphofructokinase 2. And so here we have this. Uh, in the same molecule. This here could be a different uh, phosphatase and usually it is, uh, usu usually this is protein phosphatase 2, uh, but there are other phosphatases as well. We see a very similar mechanism of this zero order ultrasensitivity with PFK1. So PFK1 phosphorylates the substrate whereas the 
fructose 16b phosphatase molecule dephosphorylates it. So again, we have an ultra zero order ultra sensitivity switch here. So if we've got PFK1 activated, we move everything into fructose 16b phosphate and go into glycolysis. If PFK1 is not activated, then we go back to fructose 6-phosphate and no glycolysis happens. So with this scheme, you can actually figure out what would happen, for example, if we do not produce CAMP, if we do not produce cyclic AMP. So what happens if we do not produce enough cyclic AMP? Without cyclic AMP, we do not get PKA activated. If we don't get PKA activated, fructose, phosphofructokinase 2 stays in this state. It produces fructose 2 6 bisphosphate Fructose 2 6 bisphosphate activates PFK1 and we are going down the glycolysis route. So without cyclic AMP, we go down glycolysis route. What happens if we, for example, if we don't have glucagon? Without glucagon, we don't get activation of adenylate cyclase. Without adenylate cyclase, we cannot produce CAMP and we are still going down the glycolysis route. So you can figure out what happens if we have mutations in these various key players. And the following questions will give you an opportunity to practice your, if you like, critical thinking, which compound uh, does what, which reaction leads into glycolysis and which doesn't. So I hope this makes sense and thank you for watching.